Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place here in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he, broke, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. The two men shuffled along down the road somewhere, a village called Emmaus, and the stranger sidled up beside them, curious. What are you talking about? It took them a minute to answer. The gospel writer puts it this way. They stood still looking sad. Who wants to be the first one to explain? To find the words which will force them to relive the painful reality in which they walk. Finally, it is Cleopas that answers with something like disbelief. Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? Then they explain... They explain that Jesus, a prophet, mighty in deed and word, was handed over to be crucified. And then he explains, we had hoped. We had hoped he would be the one to redeem Israel. They are disappointed, probably angry, a little confused, certainly grieving. This thing, this promise, this person in which and in whom they had staked Everything was gone. The promise, gone. The hope for the future redemption, gone. Now what? And so here they are, shuffling along the road, and they had hoped. I can only speak for myself, but often in the days following Easter, the weeks where we proclaim, Easter, it's not over yet. It's still Easter tide for a while, but yet I feel some of these same pangs of disappointment. It's hard to believe, and I'm left with these words, but we had hoped maybe Easter would feel different this year. Maybe we'd come to a new understanding or just feel more. 
And here we are going down the road with Cleopas and the other disciples and maybe having a hard time with our belief. The men on the road talk about the women who shared their tale of the empty tomb and yet they find no hope in the story. It's deeper than disbelief, their question. It's the hollow aching of grief and loss that has left no room for hope or faith. We wander down that same road with them and feel their disappointment. Their loss is so powerful and palpable that they nearly missed Jesus in their midst. You catch what happens next. First, this stranger who we, with this wink, we know, we're in on it. This is the risen Christ. And then he begins interpreting scripture to them. It's a little bit odd, right? It's, a, it's odd. He's a stranger, and he asks them a question, and then he has the answers for them. But it certainly gets their attention, although they still don't quite realize who it is that's walking next to them. They might have had some clue, some subconscious inkling, but they don't know. And here is where it gets really good. They invite him in. They invite this stranger in, which maybe seems radical enough for some of us to invite a stranger over to stay the night. But they invite Jesus in. It's getting late after all. And after settling around the table, Jesus takes the bread that's there for the meal and he takes it, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to them. Aha! They see immediately. They understand. They recognize Christ in their midst in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the meal and the coming together. Jesus was there all along. And then he leaves. It's interesting to me that after he vanishes, they engage in a bit of revisionist history. They didn't recognize him until the bread was broken and offered to them, but then they say, we're not our hearts burning as we walked along the road. Surely we weren't that dense to miss the risen Christ next to us. But they didn't. They didn't know. The loss and the disappointment that they felt was so deep, it clouded their vision, and we know this experience well. And in order to recognize Christ, they had to gather around a table. In my estimation and for my part, this table is central to how I understand this Christian faith. It's central to my understanding of my identity and my call, not just my identity and call as a pastor, but my call as a follower of Christ. In order to recognize Christ in our midst, we also come to the table. We must gather at the table, and we all must come and be welcome to the table. Because it is at the table that we recognize the risen Christ. This table points to the entirety of the gospel, the entirety of our faith. At this table, we learn who we are and whose we are. Around this table, we welcome, we are welcomed to be more precise. We are invited by Christ, and then we welcome others. We call it the Lord's Supper because it is first and foremost his table. It is Christ's meal to which he welcomes and invites us. When we offer an invitation to the table in this place, it is not because it is our table to invite you to. We offer the invitation as Christ offers to all of us. It is Christ's table. Around this table we share, we are one, we find unity, or we are supposed to. We call it communion, which is to say we find unity and we are made one when we share the meal together. We find unity as a community gathered in the name of Christ, and the way that we take communion, the form of the meal, it matters. You know, we didn't always take communion using individual wafers and grape juice and miniature shot glasses. 
And we didn't start taking communion with individual wafers and grape juice and miniature shot glasses by accident. And by we here, I don't just mean First Baptist Church. I mean the general Protestant population of the world. Here's a little history lesson for you. The shift away from the common cup and the common loaf, as we will observe communion today, and the shift from wine to juice, which we will still use juice today, emerged out of social movements that began in the church, but was really an attempt to change the entirety of American society. The move away from wine began with the temperance movement, led by a whole host of Protestant women. And not, first of all, Baptists, I'll have you know. It was primarily Methodists, then the Presbyterians, and then us Baptists got on board a little bit later. The temperance movement began in about 1812, taking root in these evangelical circles, not just moderation, but complete abstinence from the saloons, the bars, any alcohol, right? Uh, In 1874, the Women's Christian Temperance Union was formed. One of their banner issues was to rid the churches of wine at the communion table, and you'll know that their primary uh, victory, of course, was the amendment of, you know, national prohibition. So this was no small movement, This grape juice is no small accident. Um, They promoted the use of grape juice so much, they said, we will give you the juice if you will stop using wine. Uh, And conveniently enough, Charles Welch, who was getting his start as a juice maker and happened to be a Methodist, joined the cause, and now we have juice, Welch's in the fridge, and in our cup. As the contents of the cup changed, so did the shape and the size of the cup itself. The individual communion cup emerged as a result of sanitation concerns. If you know much about medical history and cultural history in the 1800s, we were aware of what germs are. And so these anxieties over a common cup also reveal deep anxieties about cleanliness in our culture, the borders of church and society. So now that the cup was filled with juice, not germ-killing alcohol, fears intensified about contamination and disease. In a a church where physical cleanliness was not just associated but equated with moral cleanliness, moral purity, it is no small surprise that the cleaner the physical form, the cleaner and purer the soul. So what better way to represent and preserve this by keeping communion contained, clean, pure, sanitary? Other people, of course, are nervous about the common cup. They were squeamish about sharing a communion cup with strangers, particularly the poor, the social outcasts, people we just don't quite know about. And so the shift to individual cups, one social historian has observed, really started to impact our theology, making the theology of communion more about a solitary sacrament than a shared one and focusing on the communion of the individual and God rather than communion of the entire church. I find this history interesting for many reasons. Of course, the trivial part about Welch and the grape juice and all of these things are really interesting, but also because it points to how important even these things that we call mere symbol really are. The communion meal that Christ instituted was a meal, shared among his friends. How different would it look to him today to walk into a church and observe tiny bites of bread that could barely sustain in individual cups and a ritual where we barely have to look into the eyes of our brothers and sisters as fellow children of God. Would he recognize that? How much are we really sharing at all? This meal is intended to bring us together in the shared cup and the shared bread, and we find equality and unity in our identity as called and blessed by Christ as God's children. The ways that we share communion as this body can help us understand that on a deeper level, or it can prevent us from the same. We also ought to recognize our unity around this table with Christians around the world, and we do a really good job of this once a year in October for World Communion Sunday. But in reality, all Communion Sunday should be World Communion Sunday, recognizing that all our brothers and sisters around the Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, gather at the same table, the same meal. 
But instead, our churches have so often used this table as a weapon. We've used the table to build walls between who belongs and who is left out. We welcome only those who are like us or those who's, um, and leave out those whose theology is different and how heartbreaking this is. How heartbreaking that throughout 2,000 years of church history, we've used the table to exclude rather than to welcome and include. We have decided, we have decided for ourselves who can come to the table and who cannot. People cannot come to the table because they do not believe the right things. People cannot come to the table because they do not belong to the right tribe. People cannot come to our table because they are not members of us, because they are not old enough. People cannot come to the table because they fail to give us the correct three bullet points about what it means. Around this table, we are not passing a test. Around this table, we embrace mystery, deep mystery. We taste the bread and we sip the cup. We're, it's not about secret knowledge or secret information that we are passing around. Because really, could any of us fully comprehend what we are doing when we celebrate this ancient tradition that Christ first celebrated and we celebrate the same? Could we really fully understand what we do when we gather together? The mystery of the Spirit in our midst? Of course not. There should be no barriers on the table. Age, gender, race, class, orientation. Those are our barriers, not Christ's. Around this table, we find a table of liberation. We also call it Eucharist which is basically just a way of saying it is a table of great thanksgiving. It is no accident that this table was first celebrated with Christ at the Passover celebration. And you'll remember that Passover was a time to remember, to celebrate, to reenact God's liberation of the Hebrew people from their slavery. And so Jesus celebrated the Passover meal. And likewise, even in this post resurrection meal in this gospel story the disciples were liberated they were liberated from their grief and their false expectations christ was in their midst their hopes were realized and so they were free to share and to tell and so we celebrate and remember and reenact this transformation in celebrating the eucharist along with the risen christ we do like those travelers on the road we project our hopes for the coming kingdom of God, which is already in our midst and yet not fully realized. Brian Wren puts it this way, the Eucharist is not simply a celebration of small historical victories, but a token of the final and full realization of the kingdom of God. It is a table of hope. Around this table, we share a meal. We are invited to be fed, and then we are called to feed. Jesus shared meals with all kinds of people. He did this because he knew that this is one of the most intimate ways we share with one another. And don't we all know how many times over a plate of food, maybe a glass of wine, that real communion happens? Conversation, sharing, laughter, tears, hopes, fears are shared. It's the same way that sharing food with strangers can transform us into friends and sharing food with friends can transform us into family, that this table transforms us. It invites us not just into a ritual where we barely get a snack before lunch, but it's an invitation to radical and transformational meal with strangers, friends, and family. We are all transformed because we are all called children of God. And then around this table, we are sent. It is only after they share the meal, they are fed by Christ. Disciples are then compelled to go and share. They leave, right? It's getting late. They want Jesus to stay because it's getting late. And then they go another seven-mile journey because they had to go and share what had happened to them. 
The call of Christ is not merely just to go and tell, though. It's to go and share and to feed. Because Christ invites us to the table, we invite others to the table. We break bread with others and are fed together, all of us. And so the table is missional. Around this table, we discover our mission, our identity, who we are, which is to break bread with other people. It's to break bread with all people, to welcome all people. The table of Christ is a table with room enough for all. And the kind of hospitality to which we respond at that table then is of expansive welcome. The table just keeps getting bigger. When Christ invites us to share this meal with him, he is inviting us to cross boundaries. This was never meant to be a safe table. This was never meant to become a mere ritual. I would even posit that this was never meant to be a mere symbol. It's a radical act, a radical act every time we gather around a table as equals, as brothers and sisters, and share a common loaf and a common cup. Even something that is that ordinary is radically counterintuitive when we're in the midst of a culture that tells us to remain safe, insulated, independent, sanitized. In Luke's gospel, two disciples invite Jesus in. They invite Jesus to their table, and at the table, Jesus is revealed, or more to the point, their eyes finally see. They finally recognize the risen Christ in their midst. What they realize, though, is that this table that they have invited Jesus to was Jesus' table all along. They extend hospitality to the stranger and discover Jesus is there. They find Jesus inviting them to share in a meal of grace. We understand then that every act of hospitality that we offer offers us our own doorways to grace. And so around this table, we see the heart of it all. It points to the presence of God in our midst. At this table, we are fed with real food in community with one another. Our spirits are fed in community with one another. And at the table, we meet the risen Christ. He is in our midst in our invitation and inviting us to share and to share again. We are sent from this table to feed others, to offer nourishment of body, mind, and soul. Amen.